Thank you very much, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here at Warwick, uh, back at Warwick after uh, five years uh, away in the wilds of London. And uh, one of the reasons to be back at Warwick is because behavioral science, which I'll elaborate on in a little, is so incredibly strong here. Um, both in economics and psychology and across the university, there's an enormous amount of expertise and talent uh, which is devoted to understanding individual behavior from a scientific perspective and trying to use that insight to understand social and economic phenomena. And that's what I think the essence of behavioral science is. The science uh, denotes the connection with the natural sciences and particularly the experimental methods of the natural sciences. And to a, a rough approximation, that's the uh, contribution of experimental psychology and the, and, the, and the computational and mathematical modeling techniques developed within psychology to try to account for experimental data. But of course, that becomes a very different beast if one's trying to use behavioral insights to uh, understand uh, phenomena inside businesses, uh, inside markets, inside organizations. So trying to build out from un a scientific understanding of the individual is, uh, from my perspective at least, the, what, the key uh, distinguishing feature of, of behavioral science. Behavioral science as in the business school is a, a new enterprise. Um, it's a very exciting enterprise. We have some wonderful people who've uh, joined the team and we're, we're growing all the time. Um, so I very much look forward to that process and also to working with people uh, across the business school and, and across the university and outside uh, in future years. Now, I'm going to talk about this mysterious uh, proposition that the mind is flat. And you probably never thought of the mind as having a dimensionality at all. So the fact that it's rather than being solid, it turns out to be flat is a, perhaps a curious proposition. And I won't give the game away too early, but what I want to imply by that is the, is the idea that we have this sense that minds are very deep things. That just like, um, just like rainbows seem to be very deep things, they seem to be, say, a mile or half a mile away from where you are, and wherever you are, it seems that the rainbow is about as far as it was when you were at some other location. As you move around, the rainbow seems to move around too. You never quite get to the end of the rainbow. But nonetheless, you have this strong sense that the rainbow has a depth. And it has a real point in the ground where the rainbow is in fact intersecting. There is an end of the rainbow, you just don't know where it is. So rainbows appear to have depth, but we know they don't really have depth. There is no answer to where's the end of the rainbow. And we'll talk a bit more about that analogy later. And I think that's very much true with inner mental depths as well. So if I say something or do something, you can say, why? Why did you say or do that? And I can tell you a story about it. And you might think, aha, there come some of those hidden depths. Now, I may not be very good at telling you what's going on in my mind. The depths I'm plumbing may be rather murky depths. So sometimes the story I'm telling you isn't quite right. But we have the sense that at least the idea that I might look with inside, inside my mind, inside those mental depths, is a coherent one. You might do it well, or you might do it badly, but there's a, a, there's a depth to your mind which you can explore mentally. And maybe you don't think we're very good at introspection. We're not good at looking inside our minds. And if you think that, you might think, ah, but luckily we have brain imaging. So we can do the clever things, putting people inside scanners, and we'll look and see what thoughts they're having. Or you might think, no, questionnaires will be fine, or no, we need to give people you know, richer interviews, or many different techniques. Now, all of these techniques are very valuable, but what they're not doing, according to the proposition I'm going to lay before you now, is revealing the sort of hidden uh, beliefs and desires underpinning behavior, because I, don't, well, I want to argue that those apparent beliefs and desires that we cook up when we explain our behavior are actually just being created for that moment. They're not stable. We don't have stable beliefs and desires which generate our behavior. In fact, we invent those beliefs and desires when we have to make a choice or justify an action. So, the talk has three sections. The first is the, the fictional self. Uh, I've been hinting uh, where I'm going with that already. But this isn't going to be some abstract talk. It might be have, it have its abstract moments, but it's going to be illustrated by experimental work, not all um, work that I've, I've been associated with, some of it quite old. Then I'm going to talk about the whole idea of the illusion of depth, and we'll have a picture of a rainbow, just uh, in case you don't know what one looks like, and I'll try and persuade you that uh, minds are really look quite like rainbows. And then I'll talk about implications for morality and markets with experiments. Experiments involving electric shocks, you'll be excited to hear. Okay, the fictional self. So, as I've said already, there is this sense 
that we all have, that we can look inside our minds. We can contemplate ourselves, and we may be looking to some extent through a glass darkly, but some stuff is visible, and if we look very hard or very carefully or with clever measures and clever methods, we can, we can uh, look better and find, see what's really inside ourselves. What do I believe? What do I want? How should I act? Um, what should I buy? How should I answer this questionnaire? These are all things that are getting at uh, the questions we can ask ourselves and that are getting at these hidden mental depths. But in fact, as I've hinted, I want to suggest we can't really peer into our own minds. And if we were to able to introspect, as with this, this rather alarming figure, we'd find there's really nothing there. There are no stable beliefs and desires which are there to be introspected. There's nothing, uh, nothing hidden within. Now, that's not to say we don't have a brain, of course. When you're generating your explanations for individual behaviours, it's an incredibly complex thing to do. So you have a very sophisticated machine that's explaining why you're doing things when you're doing them. But what it's not doing is working by having an inventory of fixed beliefs and desires and, uh, and attitudes, which it looks up to decide um, what's, what to do. So instead of thinking um, that we have a set of, uh, of, of stable beliefs and desires, instead you should think that we have to infer our own mental states. We have to infer what we believe, what we, th what we want. We have to figure this out by looking at our own behaviour. And I'll give you some illustrations in a minute. And often when we're faced with a new situation, we have to invent a preference, uh, a belief. When we decide that we must make up our minds, when we sit down to make up our minds, should we choose this or that, we are quite literally making up our minds. We're making up a new, uh, a, a new belief or desire. It's simply not the case that we're merely um, looking up our current stock of beliefs and desires and, and reading them off. So that is just the, 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 that's the preamble, that's the, uh, the, 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 the idea that there's no depth, uh, depths of the thoughts, they're just like rainbows, so the mind is flat just like the, the earth um, might be thought to be flat, and in the rather strange inversion of the Copernican revolution, I want to go from a sort of 3D perspective on the mind to a, to a 2D perspective. It hasn't worked very well in astronomy, but, uh, but I think it's the right for psychology. Okay, so let me give you some experimental data. And there is, there's, I could have chosen lots of different examples, and these are rather arbitrarily, arbitrarily chosen, but they're fun. So supposing you're asked in an experiment whether you believe this statement. Osano is a town in Chile. Well, I have no idea if it's a town in Chile or not, and I don't even know having read the paper. But, but you've, you've got to make a decision, and I don't know, 50% chance that it is? Who knows? Here's an interesting variation, though. This is a faint version of the same thing. So if half of your subjects get a nice, clear version of the statement, but half of them get a rather faint version, these people are much less confident that Osano is indeed a town in Chile. So these people are pretty, are fairly liable to think it is, these people aren't. Now that really is crazy, isn't it? Because that's just a change in font. What you ought to be doing is taking the statement and thinking, how much knowledge do I have about related, uh, which is related to this, and try to figure out what you think is the right answer. It really shouldn't matter what font, whether it's clear or rather unclear, the, uh, uh, the statement is written in. Why does that matter? Well, one explanation for why it matters, and a pretty natural one, is that if you're looking at this statement, it's really rather hard to read. So one of the experiences you have in reading it is, oh, that's really cognitively awful and difficult. My brain is struggling. Now, that makes the, a, a disfluent experience like that, a, 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 an experience of finding this a struggle, is something that normally goes along with statements which are, you don't know anything about, or maybe you know, know to be false. So if, I, if you're reading uh, normal text, everything's very clear, and it all makes sense. Now when you see something uh, that you don't know about, you feel that vague sense of disquiet, uncertainty, <coughs> bafflement. But you get that same sense of bafflement just because something's a bit hard to read. So that sense of dis being disfluent and stuck can be misinterpreted. You, m you may have that disfluency and think, I know what's going on here. It's because I don't really think this is true, or I'm not sure it's true. Whereas if you make it nice and natural and fluent, you're much more likely to believe it. So what's going on there? When I'm asking you a general knowledge question, you're p in being influenced by your own mental, your own mental state, your experience of 
of, of introspection, thinking, how do I know about that? Does it seem familiar? And if I make that experience disfluent, you're going to think, aha, uh -huh, I know why the reason for that is. It's probably because it's not true. It's not because of that. It's because I made it rather faint. Or indeed, um, Reber and Schwartz made it rather faint. Same thing works with lots of other, uh, other ways of distorting the, um, the input, not just faintness. Here's another rather business-related example of the same thing by Danny Oppenheimer at Princeton. So he looked at <coughs> the effect of fluency, this uh, ease with which you can read things, in a very different domain, in IPOs on New the New York Stock Exchange. And apparently IPOs have three-letter uh, three uh, acronyms associated with them. And these are, I think, not, not produced by the company. I think they're just assigned essentially randomly. Now, if it turns out that your uh, set of digits, like R RDO, say, sort of set of letters, RDO, is rather awkward, there's no way of uh, neatly saying that, you just have to say RDO, then you tend to be bought a bit less than if you had something rather elegant like car, which is easy to say. Now, that's curious, because, again, you, you should be buying... Uh, your, your stock based on facts about that stock, not whether it has a nice memorable name. On the other hand, though, if you see something with a nice memorable name, you think, ah, oh, car, yeah, the car one. Uh, um, what do I know about that? And the very fact that it has a nice memorable, memorable name will make you feel more confident and happy when you're thinking about it and make you tend to, to want to buy it. And in fact, these stocks do, I think, over the first 24 hours or so, actually do rather better than, uh, than, than other stocks because people like, like them and want to buy them. Here's a, a lovely classic social psychology experiment. I wish I'd invent, I had this idea. Uh, this was carried out in, uh, in a campus in uh, California where there's a creek running through the campus. And at one end of the creek, there's a low bridge at the bottom. And high in the creek, there's a high bridge. And there is the high bridge. And it's pretty scary walking across the high bridge. Not dangerous, but slightly scary. Now, the experiment involves accosting male undergraduates, or I guess they're typically students anyway, as they go across this bridge, and the experimenter, it could be either bridge, high or low, and the experimenters are male or female. So here you are, as a male going across this bridge. You're at the, uh, the other end of the bridge, whether it's high or low, an experimenter, male or female, comes up to you, gives you to, gets you to do some boring thing, fill in a questionnaire, and then they say, uh, for ethical reasons, we have to give you the opportunity to follow up if there are any issues with this, uh, uh, with this questionnaire, experiment, whatever it is. So you can phone me on this number if you want to discuss further. Now, the crucial question is how many people phone up? Now, if you're a male and you're being interviewed by, uh, by males, it doesn't matter whether you are on the high bridge or the, the, the low bridge. In any case, you won't bother to phone. It's, why would you? If you're a male and your interview is a female, then you are more likely to phone than the males are likely to phone males. But you're really likely to phone if you've just walked across the high bridge. Now, what's brilliant about this is this was actually predicted. And the prediction is, if I've just walked over a high bridge, I'm really adrenalized. I'm jittery. Then I meet this female experimenter, and I think, oh, wow, why am I, what, what do I feel about this person? Well, I'm really jittery. I know. I must think she's just great. I'll phone. <laughs> so that's the case where you're inferring your own emotional reaction, your own sense of attracted, the degree to which you're attracted to somebody. You're not working that out because you have some direct um, route to your, the innermost workings of your mind. You're working it out because you're monitoring your own body state. Your body state's saying, I'm feeling jittery. And therefore, you use that as a clue, just like the fluency we talked about just now. So you don't know whether you find people attractive. You don't know whether you believe a particular statement. You have to work it out from monitoring, in this case, your own mental processes, the state of your own body. You have to infer these things. Here's another example with um, Petter Johansson. So Petter uh, worked in my uh, lab at UCL, and we're working together on uh, experiments rather like this one, but not quite the same. And this is all invented by Petter before he came to work with me. So here's a, um, a, a nice experiment where you give people a couple of pictures, and you say, which of these uh, pictures do you think is more attractive? And they say, for the sake of argument, they say this one. And then, by literally using a conjuring trick, it actually had, turns out that you have, I think, both cards in both hands, um, sort of carefully concealed. So they say, they say uh, it's this one, please. 
You then hand them the card, but in fact, blow me down, that you give them the wrong per face. Okay, so in fact, you've asked them which they prefer, and then you give them the one they didn't prefer, and then you say things like, and tell me a bit about why, you know, why that's your choice. Now, the first thing that's interesting is that people don't notice. Now, you might think that's just an embarrassing thing to admit. I mean, I must have made some terrible mistake. Oh, dear, I didn't mean that one. See, you feel a bit foolish. So perhaps people did notice, but they felt a bit embarrassed to admit it. But we don't think that's right, because in some of Petter's experiments, he, gives, he asks people at the end of the experiment the following question. He says, actually, in this experiment, for half of the people we did this devious trick, some of the time, instead of giving them the, one they, the, uh, the face they chose, we gave them the opposite one. Do you think you were one of those people who got the trick? Or do you think you were one of the people who didn't get the trick? And almost everybody says, no, no, no I, I wasn't tricked. No, I was fine. Now, some people do notice. Um, so it's not, it's not that there's zero, zero people noticing. But it's quite a small number. Sort of 15% is typical. OK, so what's interesting about this? One is that people will give you a nice explanation of the reason that they chose a person, even though it cannot be the right reason because it's the wrong person. And the things they mention will often be things that could not possibly have generated their actual decision. They'll say things like, oh, very nice earrings. But that person you chose did not have earrings. So it cannot be that the earrings were a decisive factor. And so in general, what's happening is here is rationalization. I'm getting you to make a choice. Then I'm getting you to justify a choice. In fact, not the choice you made. And you think, crumbs, yes, um, why did I make that choice? I then cook up a story. That story is not generated by my checking out what, what I actually thought. I have to infer it. So if you get me to do anything and say, why did you do it, I'll have a go at explaining it. But when I'm doing that, I'm not going back and looking inside the mental operations that generated my behavior. I'm inferring it, just like you are. So if you're watching me, you might think, and why does he pick up that glass? Or why does he... Um, smile at that point, and you might be able to cook up a good story. I'm in the same position as you are. I have no special access to myself. The only thing I do have, which is special, perhaps there are two things. One is I know a lot about myself. I've seen myself wandering about a lot, and I hear myself rambling on a lot. So I know more about my life than you know about it, so I have a little bit more uh, of a clue. So I'm likely to give slightly more stable explanations. In fact, I think that's one, of the, one way you could conceive of personality, that you build up this, you accrue this vast range of behaviours and actions and thoughts, and you're trying to sort of stay in character. You think, well, I normally say this, I normally do these things, and you're, so your inferences will be, uh, will be relatively stable. But the other thing, of course, I have access to, which is not that, that profound, is I have access to my own perceptions and my own body state. So you might think, oh, he did that because he saw this person out, the corner, out of the corner of his eye, and I know I didn't. Um, because I was looking the wrong way, or you know, I had my eyes closed, or whatever it may be. So I have a bit more, a bit more um, insight into my own uh, body state and perception than, than, than you as a third party. But that's all. I don't have the ability to look inside my mind and pick out my real motivations or, or uh, actions. Okay. So the idea then is that direct introspection, looking, the ability to look inside your mind is an illusion. We don't peer into our mental depths, but we quite literally make up our minds as we're going along. We have to in figure out what we, uh, what, what we believe and desire from our past experience, what we normally do and say, and we're attempting to stay in character. So from this point of view, I think a lot of human behaviour is really quite like improvisational acting. But instead of trying to act somebody else, I'm sort of trying to act me. And, uh, and of course, I know a lot about myself, so it's quite easy to do. Um, but it's not the case that I have some completely different met methodology, that I'm just behaving naturally, and if I were trying to behave like someone else, I'd be doing something completely different. Illusion of depth. I want to give you a little bit more on this analogy. Not much, because it's a fairly simple analogy. But let me, just, um, let me just belabor it a moment. Just in case, perhaps, you think that rainbows really do have depth. Because it's a bit funny, the idea that they don't. And I want to really hammer home. They really, really don't, but they really look like they do. And minds are just like that. So imagine we're looking at a missile launch. Here's the missile launch, being launched from some faraway place over a, a great lake. And I'm, perhaps I'm sitting in various locations, or I have my scouts in different locations, and they take bearings. So this person up here says it's pretty much south, this person thinks it's pretty much east, and this person thinks it's, uh, uh, it's pretty much south southwest, or whatever it is. So we compare these bearings, and if we do that, we'll find they're all pointing to the same spot. They're coherent. So I can't tell, when I see this missile launch, 
how far away it is. But I, all I have is this two-dimensional image. But I'm pretty sure there's three dimensions uh, to, the, uh, to the problem. I think there is a definite depth. I don't know what it is. But I can get to that definite depth because we can take many different measurements, and those measurements will tie up. That's the point of bearings, after all. Two would do. But if you have three or four or five, then you'll get more and more accurate. Here, on the other hand, is a very different thing. So here's another arcing object in the sky. This arcing object, though, is a rainbow, and it doesn't really have a depth. And what does that mean? What that means, or what, what makes that not really have a depth, is that although to me it seems that this rainbow is contacting the lake of just about the shore, so I think it's just about, uh, maybe it's just slightly off the lake and just slightly, uh, slightly on, the, on, on land, but you know, I'm not precisely sure, but it seems to pretty clearly have a depth, maybe half a mile from, from where I'm standing, as it were. But if we look at different people looking at quotes of the same rainbow, you'll find that they all think it's going, it's, it, it's, uh, it intersects the ground at the same location. It's, uh, sorry, at a location in the same direction. So when you're looking at a rainbow, the position of the rainbow just depends on the sun. It's essentially always going to be the opposite side of the sun from you. In fact, there's a great circle. And, it's only, and rainbows are circular, except for the fact that the Earth is in the way. If you could get the Earth out of the way and just had a big cloud of air uh, with some water vapor in it and a sun, then rainbows would be neatly circular. And as you move around, the circle moves around too. The rainbow is just the other side of you from the sun. So this means that when I look here, I think the rainbow's up there because the sun's down here somewhere. And if I stand here, I think it's up there because the, sun, the sun's down here somewhere, and so on and so on. And so these are not going to join up. So there's no answer to the question, where's the rainbow, uh, what, what's the depth of the rainbow, because different bearings do not connect. And that, that is a general point. If you're trying, you can easily delude yourself that some property in the world is real, but you only know if it's real if you can measure it in different ways and find that those measurements cohere and agree. And I think the, the overwhelming evidence from psychology, uh, the psychology of judgment and decision-making, is that things like utilities and beliefs do not cohere. If you look from different places, if you ask different questions and try and triangulate, you find that the answers you've got just don't cohere at all. They don't point to the same place. So it's much more like this case, the rainbow, than the rocket. So you can measure the mind in many ways. You can give people questionnaires, experiments, brain imaging, you can talk to them. All of these are very valid things to do. But depending on which questionnaire you do, you'll get different answers. Depending on which experiments you do, you'll get different answers. De depending on what tasks people are doing when they're doing their brain imaging, or what you talk to them about, you'll get different answers. And if you try and bottle these together and say, OK, now we have all the evidence, that let's see what it converges on, the answer is nothing, because these simply will not be coherent. Let me give you a, a, sim a single example. Though I, I, my interpretation of the whole literature in, in uh, psychology of reasoning, judgment, and decision-making is that almost everything we see is like this. You ask a question in a different way, you get a different answer. You do an experiment in a slightly different way, you get a different answer. You make any adjustment to your experimental procedure, you find that people now like risk more or less than they did before, or they're more um, concerned about the future or the present uh, than, you, than you thought they were. This isn't you could say, ah, that shows that measurement is really hard. We need to get better measurements. But my interpretation would be, there's nothing to measure here. You're like, just like trying to find the depth of a rainbow. So here's an example from uh, Eldar Shafir, another Princeton uh, JDM person. Um, so I, want to, this, I have adapted this to a British audience, I have to admit. Uh, Bournemouth didn't appear in the original, in the original study. <laughs> you probably could guess that. So imagine you have the choice, and it's a very difficult choice, between a holiday in Bali or Bournemouth. And Bournemouth is a, very close to my heart. I was brought up for a while in Bournemouth, and, uh, and my hatred of beaches was, uh, was in fact engendered through many family, uh, family holidays uh, in which we, all we did was go down three miles to the beach in Bournemouth, and it's pretty dull stuff. So I'm slightly giving the game away here that Bali is probably a lot more interesting than Bournemouth. On the other hand, though, this holiday is really pretty expensive, and this one's really cheap. So we'll make the price difference quite large, so that you're not really sure whether you want to go for the really expensive, exciting holiday or the really dull but cheap holiday. OK, so your first question is, given some specific price and, and package and length of holiday and so on, it doesn't matter what, about the details, which would you like to choose? And if you're asked which one you'd like to choose, people generally choose, as it turns out, um, barley. Then we have a... So that's the, uh, the first version. And if you ask people why, they'll say things like, it's exciting, it's exotic, I've never been there, 
Uh, it's going to be sunny. There's lots of good reasons to choose barley. On the other hand, what if we ask people something different? And this is what I mean by ir irreconcilable bearings, different ways of looking at the same thing which just don't mesh. Instead of saying, which would you choose, we say, which would you reject? So I'm going to give you two options. I just want you to tell me which one you don't want. It's the same question, but I'm asking you in a slightly different way. And so if you ask which, is, which are you going to reject, you'd think, well, obviously Bournemouth, because that's the one you don't want, but no. The one that is normally rejected is barley. Now that's weird. If you, if you think that people have underlying preferences, you should be thinking, oh gosh, one of these must be the right answer. If we can only do better measurements, we work out which it was. And my take is the opposite to that. In fact, you don't know. There's no answer to the question whether you prefer barley or Bournemouth with the particular package and the price and so on. If I ask you in one frame, you'll cook up a story. If I ask you to frame the problem in a different way, you'll cook up a different story. And they're both stories which you've cooked up at the time of choice. In neither case are you looking inside your head into your, into your deep preferences to actually uncover what you really, really want. There's no answer to what you really want. You make it up uh, at the moment of choice. Oh, I should say something about why, why that happens. Why barley? Well, the reason is, at least according to Shafir, and I think it's quite, quite a persuasive line of argument, is that what you're trying to do is to provide a reason, a justification for your behavior. And one good thing about barley is it's got lots of really interesting features. So if you say, why would you choose? If I think to myself, why should I choose one of these? Bournemouth is just not easy to think of lots of really good reasons to go there. Whereas barley, it's really easy. There's all these wonderful features it has. So if you ask me why I'll do it, I'll think of one of those features and off I go. If you ask me to reject something, of course, I'm also in good shape with barley because it has lots of bad things too. The most important one being the price. Or maybe the long flight. The point is, it's a very extreme, strange thing. So if I have an extreme, strange thing and a really boring, dull thing, if I ask you to justify choosing one, it's going to be really easy to do to choose the uh, extreme strange thing, because there are lots of weird features you can latch onto. But if I want you to reject one, it's also very easy to, you choose the, to pick on the extreme strange thing, because it has lots of weird features to pick on. So if your job is think of a reason, one way or the other, to choose or to not choose, the extreme weird thing is the one that you pick up. And what I would suggest that is indicating, and there's so many examples uh, throughout the literature, um, which I think show the same thing in different ways, is that you should, you should take as axiomatic, or rather not take as axiomatic, that there's some real truth in there. There's a secret preference, and we just can't get at it. Uh, but somehow it's in there. Try to sort of try and see what it feels like to live in a world where that's not, not uh, something you believe. Okay, so the mind is, is flat, according to this, this perspective. We can't uncover deep but hidden beliefs, not because... Uh, but not because it's hard to measure them, but just because there aren't any. OK, how does this relate to morality and markets? I'm going to give you now the experiment with electric shocks. Some of you would have come across this before. It's a popular, uh, a popular topic for me. So here's Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham um, is somebody I used to literally walk past many days when I was at uh, University College London before I came here. And this is his body, his actual body is inside this, uh, this uh, what appears to be a, it's a wax model, but it's no wax model. And he, this is a Bentham's auto icon. So when Bentham died, he wanted to essentially start a new sort of uh, funereal uh, fashion. It didn't catch on. I think this is the only one in existence. And he had himself uh, sort of embalmed um, in full dress, as you can see, um, sitting in a cabinet in full display uh, to this day in University College London. And as you walk around the corridors, you will get a glimpse of him. The head, unfortunately, is now a wax replacement. It was taken out for cleaning, I think, about 30 or 40 years ago. And it was actually so decayed that it was actually rather difficult to put it back together. So they popped the head uh, in some museum somewhere and uh, stick stuck on a, a wax replica. Macabre. Nonetheless, Bentham, a, a clearly an idiosyncratic and curious character and very interesting, uh, an interesting person. I think he supposedly invented jogging. Seems slightly hard to believe that no one had jogged before Bentham. <laughs> but as a, as, a, as a way of uh, improving the health, I think Bentham was a, was a pioneer in jogging. Uh, and also, apparently, the wearing of underwear was another one of his major innovations. <laughs> but these are not things I'm going to be focusing on here. Um, Bentham in, was one of the pioneers of the very important and, and deep um, philosophical idea of utilitarianism. The idea that 
the right thing to do, both as individuals and politically, is determined, uh, is, is, should be to be guided by maximising the greatest happiness of the, of the greatest number in his formulation. So roughly speaking, we want to figure out how, roughly speaking, happy people are, how much utility they have, and we want to set up the world in such a way that the average happiness of uh, the people in it is as great as possible. And as an individual, I should guide, uh, guide my, and judge my own behaviour by the degree to which I make the people around me, and indeed myself, I count one, just like everybody else, uh, happier rather than sadder. And that's actually a pretty appealing, appealing idea, actually, and I'm, I'm very fond of it. But I think it's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is because it presupposes there is this stable notion of value or utility which you can somehow measure. And like all other internal mental constructs, I want to suggest that that is going to be very difficult to uh, pin down. And I'll give you an example in a second. Okay. So let's look at the utility of electric shocks. Clearly negative, right? It's not nice to have an electric shock. So actually, I'm secretly going to switch around and I'm going to talk about the utility of pain relief. So in the experiment I'm going to tell you about, you get electric shocks, but you can pay to avoid them. So how much utility, how much goodness does it, do you get from avoiding a shock? And the shocks aren't terrible, but they're not trivial. So you have the, have the little shock pad on your, on your hand, and it sort of, your hand slightly twitches. It's not very nice. And when the shocks are very low, it's just a kind of strange, kind of uh, fuzzy sensation. And as the shocks get higher, it starts to creep up your arm rather alarmingly, and it's pretty sharp and unpleasant. So this is not a horrendous shock. We're not putting people through agonies here. But on the other hand, um, there's a real utility to avoiding this. And I'm going to pay money. And people do pay money to avoid these shocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to get people to play a kind of auction. I won't go into the details about how this works, but it's a sort of auction with themselves in a curious way. A thing called a BDM auction, where they have to put up money to avoid the shock. So on each trial, let me give you the procedure, I'm going to give you some money. So for example, I might give you 40 pence on each trial. And then you get a test shock. The shocks can vary. So you get a tester, and you might think, oh, that wasn't too bad. So that's your ne the next audit. That's the wrong one. So you get the test shock, and you think, well, that wasn't too bad, or maybe that was off. Now you can pay between 0 and 40p to avoid that shock uh, being repeated 15 times. So you've just had one test, and you can't avoid that, but you can avoid 15 more of them if you want. And if, for example, you think that it's worth paying 15p to avoid this shock, you think, all right, then, I'll bid 15p. Now then, purely randomly, we determine the price, as it were, of this uh, to avoid the shock, the price of pain relief. So it might be anywhere between 0 and 40. Now that means that if you bid 40, you have to give up all your money. I give you 40p, well, how much are you going to bid? 40p, you say. All right, I have my money back, but you don't get the shock. Great. You could go through the whole experiment like that, with no shocks at all. But some of the shocks aren't too bad, so you probably won't. So you might think, oh, well, it wasn't too bad. I'd be willing to pay 15p to avoid that one, but no more. So the price is determined randomly. Say the price is 30p. What you've said is, I'd rather have the money, frankly. I'm not paying 30p to avoid that shock. So you just take the shock. If, on the other hand, the price is, say, 10p, you pay 10p. Okay? What you're saying is, I won't pay more than x. And x is the thing we're looking at. We're trying to get you to value the shock. And there are reasons why this uh, should, in, in, in theory, be a way of getting people to reveal their true preferences, their true, the true monetary value of, of pain relief. And uh, there are a couple of things to note about the way we do this experiment. One is that we do have blocks of trials. So here's a, a, a block of trials where, in fact, there are only ever three shocks. So here you have low shocks mixed with medium shocks. Here's another block where high shocks and medium shocks are mixed together. And here's another one where low and high shocks are mixed together with no mediums. Okay, so there are two, three types of shock, and in a particular block you only get two types. Now here's the thing that is actually the most important of all. When I give you your uh, money at the beginning of each trial. I might even give you, I might give you 40p a trial, or I might give you 80p a trial. Now let's just contemplate how this shouldn't matter for a second. Supposing you value a shock at 15p. So I say, all right, that wasn't too bad. I'll pay 15p, but no more. If I've given you 40p, you should think, well, that 15p is my value. That's it. 15 is what I'm going to say. If I've just given you 80p, you should still think, well, 15p is my value. That's how much that avoiding that shock is worth to, pay, to me. It should not make any difference. 
So it'd be, if it made a difference, that would be rather like the following. It'd be like going into a shop and you want to buy a Mars bar. And the person behind the counter says, well, these Mars bars are rather expensive. Um, and say 50p for, I don't know, what is a Mars bar? I have no idea. 70p, 80p, I've never bought a Mars bar for about 20 years. I have no idea. Say, uh, what is it? what's a Mars bar cost? Say, well, say 50p. I don't, don't know if that's a great bargain or uh, a total rip-off. Uh, sorry, uh, so 50p for a Mars bar. Uh, and I then look in my pocket and I think I've got a five pound note. So I think, oh yeah, 50p is a good price, I'll have it. Um, on the other hand, if I looked in my pocket and I had one pound coin, I should think, that's an outrage. 50p? No way. Now that's ridiculous, of course, because whether I think this is good value, how much money I'm willing to sacrifice to get a Mars bar should be independent of how much money I have in my pocket at the moment. But that's what's going on in, in this experiment. All we're doing is saying, here's a bit of money. OK, make a judgment now. And that how much money we give you should be irrelevant. It won't be irrelevant, of course, if your valuation is 60p. So if you think it's worth 60p, then in, the, in this case, I'm giving you 80, and you can bid up to 80. So you might bid 60, which would be very sensible. And in the case of 40p, well, obviously, you don't need to bid more than 40. You, in fact, you can't. You just bid the maximum. You don't get the shot. So it's clearly going to matter in those cases. But the cases that matter are the ones which are, are below 40p. OK. So here's some data. There's, this is not terribly. This is first slide, nothing terribly exciting. Second slide, you should, you should be surprised. So here are the, the different shocks, medium, high, and low. And let's just notice one thing, which is of some interest, which is that the amount you're willing to pay for the medium shock is dependent on which other thing it's paired with. So if the medium shock is paired with low shocks, you think, cool, that was terrible, that medium shock. Oh, no, I'm not having that. So you're willing to pay 25p to avoid it. If, on the other hand, it's paired with the high shock, the high shock seems pretty terrible, and the medium shock doesn't seem so bad now, because the high shock is much worse. So now you're willing to pay, I think it's about 18p, maybe a little bit more. So that's interesting. It turns out that the amount you're willing to pay to be relieved of the same pain, physiologically exactly the same pain, differs depending on what, else, what, what your contrast is. But that's not the really interesting thing. The really interesting thing is this graph here. Now you might think, hang on, but that's the same as the previous graph. It is the same as the previous graph, but for one thing. What I've showed you before was the case where we had 40p. I gave you 40p and I said, bid between 0 and 40. And that's what we've got there. And you can see the scale, 0, 5, 10, up to 35. Now we're going to look at the case where you would bid from 0 to 80. So on each trial, I give you 80p. And now look at the scale, 0, not to 35, but to 70. So what you've in fact got, it's exactly the same graph but now, people are bidding exactly twice as much. So it's like saying, if I've, got, um, if I've got one pound in my pocket, I'll pay 50p for a Mars bar. If I've got two pounds in my pocket, I'll pay a pound for a Mars bar. If I've got five pounds in my pocket, two pounds fifty. So how much money I've just been given, 80p or 40p, will completely determine, completely drive the amount of money I'm willing to pay for pain relief. And that's crazy. Because I, once I walk out of the experiment, I take my money and I buy stuff with it. And so the value of that money is completely independent of what was going on in the experiment. It has a standard value. So it should be the case that my valuation of my own subjective, subjective experience is my pains. shouldn't depend on the uh, amount of money you've just given me, but it does by a factor of two in this case. But not just that. The whole date pattern of data is completely replicated. So according to this perspective, there's no answer to the question, how much do you value a pain or avoidance of pain? Change the question, you get a different answer. Do the experiment one way, so 20p. Do the experiment another way, 40p. Do it another way, 60p. And again, you might think, oh, hang on, what's the true value? And I think the answer is none. There is no true value. You could get any value out of people, pretty much, by just changing the amount of money you hand them before asking them the question. So utilitarianism fails. The idea that we should try to act in a moral way by by uh, making, giving people the greatest utility possible, on average, it is not a bad idea because it's difficult to measure utility, or as a popular problem with utilitarianism is the, that it's very hard to compare utilities from one individual to another. That's all true and good, but the real problem is that utility is just an incoherent concept even within the individual. So if you get me to try and value something as basic as a pain, I just can't do it in a stable way. Okay. Now, you might think, but what about prices? Economists are very, very interested and concerned in pr with prices, and prices are pretty stable things. So it's true that if I actually had any idea what a Mars bar cost, 
say, say it's 50p, that if I were to go into a shop and be told Mars bars here are 80p, I'm walking out. I'm not going to buy it. So if I knew the price, that will determine whether I buy or I don't buy. Roughly speaking, because I can go around the corner and buy the Mars bar more cheaply. Now, prices are pretty stable. Maybe the results we get in these experiments aren't stable, but maybe prices could be used as a way of revealing what people's real preferences are. Maybe they are the stable structure that we need to be working with. Okay, so here's a, a rather it's strangely inverted um, supply and demand curve for economists here. Um, so here we're going to look at varying market price, and we're going to look at, uh, this is the classic, classic diagram, in, invert, with the axes are flipped. Uh, for, for reasons of the way psychologists like to think about things. Um, we're looking at the price and, and, and supply, of, or demand, quantity. So if I have a high price for something, say it's a Mars bar, then as the price goes up, then demand will go down. So real Mars bar enthusiasts will keep on buying, but other people will just stop and buy something else. On the other hand, if the price goes up, supply will increase, of course. I'll be really willing to, to make lots of Mars bars if I get a good price for them. And the point of intersection, according to the classical story, is going to determine the market price. I want you to focus on this curve here. This is demand. This is the sort of psychology bit. Supply is all about how to make Mars bars efficiently. Want to make more Mars bars? How big a factory do I have to, 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 uh, to build? How much more efficiently can I build to make Mars bars now, given I have to create so many of them, and so on and so on. But this is the psychology part. This is determining looking at the question of how much I'm willing to pay for my Mars bar. Now, I'm not interested really in one good or another, just the abstract question. So let's look at that in the context of pain, in fact, using the very data we just talked about. So if you think about it, people, we've just got people to do an experiment where they're actually telling us how much they're willing to pay at different prices for a good. So if I've said, I'll pay 15p but no more for that pain, then I know that with that pain, if I put the price at, say, 10p, then the person who said 15 is fine by me, they will pay it. And the person who said 5p is my maximum won't pay it. So as I move the price up, I can get more or less, I can tell how many people would, quote, buy my pain relief. So the idea is we've got, already got the experimental data to understand how many people are going to buy pain relief in this experiment at different prices. So here's the graph. This is, these are demand curve graphs, just like the one we talked about a second ago. And here we are looking at the way we, what happens when we vary the price. So if the price is very low, almost everybody will buy the pain relief. If the price is very high, almost nobody will. But the really interesting thing is the fact that these graphs, the, these uh, lines here, come from the ATP case. They come from the case where um, I have to, I'm given on each trial ATP to play with. So if I'm given ATP, well, then I will be very happy to pay a lot of money to avoid a given pain. So say we look at the blue line, that's the, uh, the low pain in the, in the context of the, uh, where the other pain is medium. It doesn't really matter what it is. So it's a particular pain. As the price goes up, I buy, less and, I, I, I buy less and less of it. But I'm willing to pay a fairly large amount to avoid this pain. But if I was in the other condition, with 40p as my endowment instead of 80p, I'd buy far less of it. So my demand curve has changed by a factor of two just because of this tiny manipulation. So I've given you a bit more money to play with on each trial. So the point is, not that just that we uh, are sort of implicit valuations in, in, an, in, an exp in an explicit judgment task, how much would you will it, uh, uh, pay to avoid this, uh, are showing this relativity, but we can translate that into classic sort of economic uh, language. So we can see demand curves as themselves being incredibly uh, flexible. And of course that means that prices are going to be very flexible in this market too. If you imagine there was a supply curve, where the supply and demand curve cut is going to be very different in the case of the ATP condition versus the 40P condition. It's simply not stable. Now, you might say, ah, oh, but the thing is, you haven't got any, any experience with shocks. You don't really know what they're supposed to cost. A bit like me and Mars bars. So I could pay anything for a Mars bar because I don't know the market value. But once I've bought a few Mars bars or a, a few uh, bits of pain relief for shocks, I'm going to stabilize. I'm going to think, all right, now I realize that I will pay this and I won't pay that, and, and down the road I can get this same pain relief for less money and so on and so on. Now that's quite true, but I think that works against one if one's trying to build, build a foundation, uh, a, a theory which says that the foundation for value is, given by, is revealed by price. Because what that's telling you 
is that the real reason you know how much things are worth is because you see how much they are sold for in the market. It's not that you can just introspect the amount of agony that you're experiencing and think, well, that more or less balances with the amount of pleasure I'll get from this extra money. You can't do that. And that's what this, that is what this experiment is telling you. When you give someone a novel stimulus, they're lost. Why it's different for our real goods, of course, is that we have lots of experience of really buying and selling them. I'll just jump through those other examples. Same, same deal with, with other parts of the, uh, uh, of the experiment. So the conclusion here is that prices don't really reveal preferences or your underlying beliefs. So, sorry, but prices don't reveal preferences, not prices, but they're in fact shaped by your, your preferences. So the point is that there's a sort of two-way relationship between value, value and price. So if it's the case that something's very expensive, I tend to value it more. So for example, uh, if I'm thinking about how much I'm going to pay for a cup of, or a cup of tea at home, I might think that a tea bag, which costs 25p, is a total outrage. I'm not buying a tea bag for 25p. Seems a ridiculous amount of money. How much do I enjoy tea anyway? On the other hand, if I'm going to a canteen or a cafe, I might pay £1.50 or £2 quite happily. And if you say, oh, it's not just the average tea, it's a specially good one, I'll think, oh, all right then, I'll pay another 50p or even a pound. And I'll do this quite cheerfully. Now, why am I doing that? I'm doing that because my perception of value, my perception of how much pleasure I'm going to get from this experience is being shaped by my observations of the prices. So rather than thinking, no, no, I know how much uh, what I prefer, I know wh how much I like different things, and I'm going to, that's going to determine the way prices work because the demand curve is given by my inner preferences. That's really the wrong way to think about it. Your perception of uh, your price is determined by values, but also value itself is being kicked around by your observations of prices. If things look expensive, you value them more. Okay, so I just want to finish with the, uh, the slogan, really, that the mind is flat, that the idea that there's m mental depths, real, uh, real truths about how much we value things, what we really believe, uh, what we really desire, and these are stable and they guide our behaviours is an illusion. And that illusion is just as important if you want to understand people buying things, you want to understand ethics, or you want to understand the behaviour of markets. Thanks very much.